Thanks. Um, just to say, it's a little hard for me to see the slides, so I'll yeah, do this a bit too. virtually. Um, so th thanks for the introduction, Eileen. Yeah. Um, before I start, I'd like to acknowledge that we are meeting today on traditional and unceded territory of the Mohawk people. We are grateful for the opportunity to meet on this territory and to commit to the pursuit of truth, reconciliation, and allyship. I also want to recognize that UNAIDS will be holding a session on decolonizing the HIV response uh, during the, the conference later this week. Um, so I'll go ahead and start in my next slide, please. Oh, I've got it, sorry. So nothing to disclose. Um, I also want to recognize Marissa Vicari and Jeff Eaton who provided concept or ideas on this presentation. And most importantly, I want to recognize that Country teams are putting this data together and sending it up to UNAIDS. UNAIDS is mandated then to compile that, and then I'm putting it together and summarizing it. But I just want to rec recognize all the work that goes into this data that I'm presenting here. So where are we at currently? The number of new child infections is, is continuing to be quite flat over time with 160,000 new HIV infections in 2021. Let's see if I do this. Um, ART coverage is, remains at 81% of all uh, pregnant women living with HIV receiving some sort of ARVs. You can see that's fairly flat and even a slight decline since what we saw in 2019. Overall, we have 1.7 million children living with HIV, so we still have a lot of work to do in this group here. Next, oh, sorry. What's important to notice is the dis distinct disruption that we've seen from COVID in the provision of ART to women who are pregnant and living with HIV. In this slide here, I have uh, five of the seven, sorry, six of the, sorry, six of the eight regions that UNAIDS recognizes. The ones that aren't on here are uh, Western and Central Europe and North America, in addition to Eastern Europe and Central Asia. We just don't have good enough uh, understanding of, of the number of pregnant women who are living with HIV in those countries, so they're not represented here. But what's important is to look at the um, drops off in Asia and the Pacific, Caribbean for 2020, Latin America 2020 and 2021, Middle East and North Africa, a slighter decline, but also for 2020, 2021, and then West and Central Africa, that drop in 2020. Um, that appears to be the impact of COVID. One of the things to notice, though, is that when we pull this data together, we're getting programmatic data from clinics on how many women were provided with services. The denominator in that measure is a modeled estimate of how many HIV-positive pregnant women there are. When there's sharp disruptions in fertility, that, the, our models might not capture that. And so I know there's a lot of discussion about what might have happened to fertility during COVID times. I think in some countries were seeing sharp drops and some countries were showing increases. And so that fluctuation isn't shown here, but it's good to keep that in the back of your mind as you're looking at these values. If there was an increase in fertility, then we're underestimating the impact here of COVID on our reduction in, in preventing new infections and reaching mothers who are HIV positive um, with treatment. So let's stop again and just think a little bit about the causes of, of what's leading to vertical transmission. And it's appropriate that Chewe walks in at this time because <laughs> Chewe is the champion of this. Um, when you look at this slide, look at that dark orange piece at the top. That's the number of new child infections that occurred because a mom seroconverted, a mom or a, a pregnant woman or a breastfeeding mother seroconverted while she was pregnant or breastfeeding. The yellowish part is the number of women who did not receive any ARV at all during pregnancy and breastfeeding, and thus the, there were 75,000 new child infections. The gray is women who dropped off treatment, and the blue is women who were not virally suppressed. They were on treatment, but not virally suppressed. What I'm showing here is the difference at the global uh, Eastern Southern Africa and Western Central Africa. What's important to note, though, is that of those 75,000 women who did not receive any ARVs, Almost half of those are in West and Central Africa. So we know where to focus our efforts to make sure we're closing that gap. Among the incident infections, those, that dark orange piece, um, more than half of those were in Eastern Southern Africa. So again, clear need to focus on preventing new infections on pregnant and breastfeeding women in, that, in Eastern Southern Africa. Um, just to really recognize too that there's a big difference by country. 
Um, and so here I'm showing Botswana, who's done incredibly well, I'll come back to this in a minute, Nigeria, South Africa. And recognizing the different colors in this graph, the colors are the same as what I was talking about before, but now I've separated on the top of the graph are infections that happen during pregnancy, and in the bottom part of the graph are infections that happen during breastfeeding just to recognize the very big differences there. So in Nigeria, for example, the focus really needs to be making sure that women are, first of all, attending antenatal care, and then second, that they're linked to treatment and started on treatment and, and maintained on treatment. Um, the second point is for Botswana and South Africa. So Botswana are doing incredibly well, but they still have new infections happening. We need to make sure that those are stopped, and they can do that by really protecting women um, who are pregnant and breastfeeding from seroconverting themselves. So some, some of the, what's important to recognize, too, is that some countries have done incredibly well. So this is possible. We can do this. It's just a matter of really focusing our efforts. So countries like Botswana, Cote d'Ivoire, Iswatini, Malawi, South Africa, Uganda, Zimbabwe have achieved more than a 70% decline in new infections since 2010. How do we make sure that the remaining countries do so? It's our challenge. As a result of those high prevalence countries succeeding, we've seen that the number of vertical, or the, the vertical transmission rate has come down quite considerably. But it's quite flat there at the end because of the, the flattening of our uptick in um, uh, reaching women with, with tr uh, treatment. And just to say, so this slide is showing you in the blue part the vertical transmission that's happening before six weeks, and the orange is the breastfeeding transmission. So recognizing that there's still quite a considerable amount of, of transmission happening during both breastfeeding and the pregnancy. So let's talk a little bit about treatment. Um, so, you know, I wish, I wish so much I could come to these meetings and tell you the positive news, but we're still seeing incredibly low rates of coverage among children, 52% of children who are living with HIV estimated to have ART coverage. That's compared to 76% in adults. When I show this graph, I'm using the absolute numbers here so that you can see how far that orange line is from the blue line, which is the blue um, bars, which are the number of children on treatment. Um, we, we recognize that there are continued uh, decreases in the number of children living with HIV. And you know, that's gonna be because of multiple reasons. One is the, the children aging out. So about 140,000 children in the year 2021 aged out into the adult or older adolescent uh, age group you know, to age 15. In addition, we had about 98,000 AIDS deaths, which is still horrible given that we have a preventable uh, way to prevent those deaths. Um, and then we also have reduced new infections. So those three factors are playing into that orange line coming down. But we're still far away with the blue bars to reaching children to make sure that they're on treatment. A big important uh, challenge, though, is early infant diagnosis. The graph here is showing um, the coverage of early infant diagnosis. So that's tested, PCR tested by eight weeks. And you can see um, that Eastern Southern Africa is doing the best at around 71%. Globally, we're at 62% EID coverage versus Western Central Africa, where it's actually coming down at 25%. Um, so, so a lot to be done there. But even with early infant diagnosis, even if we get those values up, you saw in the earlier slide how many infections occur during breastfeeding. So it's important that we find other ways of identifying children living with HIV. 60% of children, 5 to 14, are living with HIV and untreated, uh, sorry, 60% of those children who are not on treatment are in the five to 14 age group. So we need to find new ways of identifying those children. Some things that are being discussed in some of the, po the posters that are coming up um, are on self-testing among diverse populations of children, home testing, and other children living with, H <laughs> and testing of other children living with HIV. Um, so possibly some good news. Here's something positive here to say. We're seeing in our viral load suppression among children who are on treatment an uptick in the, the proportion that are virally suppressed. So we think that this is likely due to the optimization of drugs, so that's great news, and great news probably because of this crowd in this room, so thank you. Um, what we do see still, and so that's, we're seeing that in both Eastern and Southern Africa and Western Central Africa, What's important to note, though, is that we're still quite a ways below what's happening with the adults. So trying to continue to increase that viral suppression among those on, on treatment is important. 
Um, so one piece to note is that children exposed to HIV perinatally, they will make up a growing, or they do make up a growing proportion of children, especially in the high burden countries. We estimate globally there's 16 million children who are exposed to HIV or, and or exposed to ART. Um, and countries such as East Swatini and South Africa, we're seeing over one in four children were exposed to HIV. And so considering what were the impacts of, those, um, of that exposure and how that might affect children going forward is important for this group. Thanks. And um, I also want to acknowledge that the adolescents 15 to 19 living with HIV, we continue to struggle to get good data on this population through our regular reporting. We have about 70 countries reporting, and from those, data, from those countries, we estimate 58% of adolescents 15 to 19 uh, are, are on treatment, again, quite a bit lower than the 76% of all adults 15 plus. We also note the very low coverage of children zero to four years, mostly because those are children who are newly infected and have not yet been diagnosed. So finally, let me conclude by saying what is working well. So in high prevalence settings, in some high prevalence settings, there's been systematic testing of pregnant women at antenatal clinic and linkage to treatment, which has led to sharp reductions in, in vertical transmission, showing that this is possible. We can reduce these new infections to very low levels. Uh, sorry, and I forgot to mention Botswana earlier, having achieved the silver tier within the elimination of mother-to-child transmission pathway. However, yes. <laughs> However, it requires really high coverage of antenatal care attendance and consistent testing across sites. We're not seeing that in Western Central Africa, and that's what needs to change in that region to, to reduce these global numbers that we continue to see. So what's not working? I think the challenge with ensuring pregnant and breastfeeding women have the ability to stay negative is a continued challenge. We've got the tools. We just need to make sure that we're implementing them uh, at scale to prevent transmission to, or to prevent women from becoming infected. We're also struggling to find the children living with HIV, and I think there's ongoing effort to try to figure out whether it's index testing or moving on to other creative methods um, to make sure that those children know their status. Um, finally, d d note that treatment coverage is higher in older age groups, but the actual absolute numbers of children not on treatment is largest in that oldest age group, 15 to 19. So what has potential? One is offering women at risk of HIV infection prep to avoid transmission during pregnancy of, or breastfeeding. Sorry, that's not of breastfeeding, but or, or breastfeeding. Um, Self-testing or home testing for older children and women or, part, or their partners. And finally, a point here on community-led monitoring to reduce the challenges that we see, the reasons that women aren't getting to care or maybe not staying uh, adhering to, the HIV, uh, to treatment is because of poor service delivery. And things such as community-led monitoring, which allows women living with HIV or a community of, of people living with HIV or key populations to come into a clinic and make sure that the clinic service providers understand what their limitations are and why they're not getting the services is critical for closing those remaining gaps. Last slide is just to say thank you. Um, to note the data is available at aidsinfo.unaids.org as of 2.30 this evening. And also please note that this data that I've just presented is embargoed until 2.30. Thank you. <laughs>